Today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a strong Christian and what the church must do to come out of its state of weakness. Now, before I lay all of that out, I want to show you what I mean when I say the church is weak. Like, I want to try to explain that. And the church is the bride of Christ. So we have to be careful how we talk about the church. So I want to be careful not to insult the Lord's bride, which I am a part of the body of Christ and I love the church. So don't get me wrong, even though today might be a little bit heavy. Um, I just want to lay it out and be real about the, the state of the current church in the 21st century. And before we get into that, I want to let you know about Tuesday, November 14th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Pastor Matt from Logos Bible Software is going to do a live Zoom session with me, and we're going to walk you through how to go deeper in your Bible study journey. Like if you want to know Bible study tools, how to you know go into depth on certain passages of scripture, get the best commentaries and everything all in one place, you're going to want to be here you really need to check this out. I've had Logos for about four or five years and it is excellent. I don't even scratch the surface of its potential because there's so much you can do with it. So we're going to go through it and see what it can provide for you as you learn to study. And if you want to join that Zoom session, I will post the link on my social media and send it to my subscribers this week. So go to shandafulbright.com and subscribe. And again, it's a free event. You don't have to pay anything to sign up. You're just going to look at his expertise and what he wants to show you with study tools and what I use. And that's, that's how we're going to do it. With that said, I do have a new YouTube series called Walking in the Word, where you join me with your own Bible and your highlighters, and we study the Bible together in context. Right now, we're doing the book of John. I'm telling you right now, John is one of my favorite books. I feel like I say that about a lot of books, like that one's my favorite book, but seriously, John is the very first gospel that I read. And when I wanted to like really start digging into being consistent with the Bible. So John was the first book that I read and I read it like three times. And then before I moved on to the book of Acts, I was like, okay, God, I'm going to, I'm going to go into the book of Acts. Like I'm really nervous about this. I don't know if I can handle it, but I laid the foundation and then I started reading Acts and I was like, oh, wait, I get it. I understand it. So John was like the foundational gospel that I started off with. And I talk about like all of that, you know, why, why John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in those walking in the word series. And they're very short and they're kept that way on purpose because I want you to get like small chunks of it as we go along, which are, I'm, they're about like maybe five to 10 minutes, but it's meant for you to do it with your Bible and not just have me teach it to you by listening to me or watching me. So it's meant that you, so that you can go through it with me. We could do it together. You learn to exegete scripture, which is to proper, properly interpret scripture. And I give you all the tips on how to do that and lay that from the foundation. So if you haven't been watching, watching, walking in the word on YouTube, go back to the beginning. You can just pick like click the parts of my channel that says walking in the word and it'll tell you the each video in order. So I highly recommend doing that. And I use Logos Bible software to even prepare those teachings too. So check that out. And hopefully you'll join me on the 14th of November when me and Pastor Matt talk about the Bible study tools, because I am here for discipleship. And one thing about discipleship, which is totally not in my nose. And I know like, I'm like babbling about this, but I love talking about discipling church because well, Jesus told us Matthew 28, 19, go make disciples of all nations. But biblical literacy is huge to not being deceived by false teachers. And biblical literacy is huge in order to truly understand the message that God has given to us. So I want to help teach you how to study the Bible. And honestly, not a lot of churches will go through and take the time to teach how to study your Bible. So I want to provide that with YouTube. And it's kind of like my way of getting to sit down with you and you get to see my face and maybe I tell a joke or two and we laugh together and then you get to study your Bible. Okay. Let's get back to the weak church, strong Christian topic for today. In this episode, I'm going to cover first, what do I mean when I say the church is weak? Two, how does the church in the West show its weakness? And then three, what is the posture 
of the Christian? What are we supposed to look like, sound like, live like? I want to talk about that. And here's the deal. It's going to be a little bit heavy, okay? I know if you follow me on Instagram, sometimes I can get like, with when the culture ramps up with the evil, I just get so like, let me, I just got to talk about this, you know, and I have to tell myself, calm yourself, Shanda, like calm down, take a chill pill and just, you know, take a chill pill. And so I do have to tell myself that. So if some of you are like, Shanda, we don't want to hear you constantly talking about like negativity or this or that. It's not going to be negative. It's going to be heavy. It's not going to be negative. It might be some negative stuff in there, but we're going to end it on a good note because the Bible is the, the way that we learn. And remember, the Bible doesn't just encourage and lift you up. It also corrects, right? That's what the word of God is useful for. And that's why it's a living word. It'll always be applicable to the life of the believer because it's always going to refine us and help us. That's part of the sanctification process. So just keep in mind that there are going to be times in this episode where it might be like, oh, shoot, I don't want to hear that stuff. But again, it's going to be good because we're going to we're going to leave it to the word of God to encourage us at the end. So what do I mean when I say the church is weak? I don't know if you've ever heard of John Cooper. He's the host of the Cooper Stuff podcast and the lead singer of the Christian rock band Skillet. Totally my generation and one tough dude. I'm going to tell you right now, I love listening to John Cooper, Cooper Stuff podcast. He's also funny. He's super, he's super funny. He's kind of like a little quirky in his funny, <laughs> like he's just not as like, not as polished, which I don't feel like he's inappropriate or anything. I don't mean that when you say not polished, I just think he's real. And I love that part of him. Cause he's just like, but he drops the truth bombs. And he's not afraid to stand up for the truth. So I had a, the privilege of meeting John and his wife last year at the national conference in Christian apologetics in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And, um, he's just, he's real. He's the real deal. He just authored a book called Wimpy Week and Woke, How the Truth Can Save America from Utopian Destruction. I can't wait to read it. And actually, I think there's pre-orders going right now because you can, it's about to drop. So I, I highly recommend, I'd love to have him on my podcast too. I need to just reach out and be like, Hey, you want to come on my podcast? But he's, he's always touring and everything too. So we'll see. But John was at the Dove Awards, which is the Christian Awards for music artists, kind of like the Grammys, which on the Grammys, it's like all genres of music. Dove Awards is just Christian music. So let's make that point right on, right up front. And this is, you know, other Christian artists were there and some of them came in drag. They literally wore dresses. Of course, it's men wearing dresses. And per the Roy's report, former Cademan's Call singer-songwriter Derek Webb attended the award ceremony in Nashville, Tennessee with openly queer Christian artist, similar and drag queen, Flamey Grant. Yes, you heard me say Flamey Grant. And if you've been in the Christian world long enough, you know Amy Grant has been a Christian singer for years, like since I was a kid. So it's a play on her name, Flamey Grant. And they're Christian artists. They're queer, openly queer Christian artists, which is an oxymoron, but you can say it today in the 21st century and people don't think much of it. But this is what they said. The 54th annual Dove Awards, here we come, Webb tweeted with a picture of the trio, the other two, Flaming Grant and this similar person. And um, that was on ChristianHeadlines.com. They're the ones who also reported all of, all of what I'm about to tell you. They continued to report in response to the Dove Awards controversy, we, or Webb defended his choice of attire in a video posted to X, which is formerly Twitter. As a cis straight white man, now this is the guy formerly from Cademan's Call, Webb left them a few years ago, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but he's not queer, gay, whatever you whatever you call it. He's a straight white man, but he'd wore a dress, and this is what he says. As a cis straight white man, I walk into a room like that, and any room with an incredible amount of advantage and privilege. 
Webb, who's previously won three Dove Awards, explained, if I'm attending as an ally of friends and colleagues, I should do everything possible to surrender that privilege at the door. If the way you look at my loved ones isn't the way you're looking at me, I'm not truly standing with them, he continued. So Webb used to be with Caveman's Call and left the group because of his beliefs and to work on his solo career. And then we'll get into John Cooper's response uh, soon. But this is the setup for the Dove Awards. There, um, he John's going to respond to what took place at the Dove Awards. But Webb and these other two men dressing as women showing up at the this Dove Awards, they were like, hey, this is the place where we don't need your approval because we approve of ourselves. Thank you very, very much. But we're here because they need a little bit of joy here in this space that never allows for people like us. So they took it upon themselves to invade the Christian music uh, awards, the Dove Awards. And, you know, the thing is, is that Cademan's Call, this the singer Webb, is at the Dove Awards. Let me let me make that clear. Cademan's Call is different now. They, they don't have Webb as their singer anymore, so they're off on their own. But he's at the Dove Awards, a place where Christian artists are recognized for the music that they make for God, for the Lord. Yet here he is, not identifying himself as a Christian, but as a cis straight white man. Notice what he says. I'm a cis straight white man, not a Christian man of God. He's identifying himself cis straight and white. He's the oppressor. That's the language he's using. He's using critical race theory language here, which also is gender theory or queer theory, which stems from a Marxist worldview because Marxism is a worldview. We talk about that in Barna's worldview inventory. I laid out those worldviews at the beginning of this year. So if you did, if you haven't listened to those, go back to, I don't know, January's podcasts or so and start checking those out. What does that mean? His identity is wrapped up into the color of his skin and in his straightness, his sexuality, more than it is in Christ. And, and I would say not even more than it is. It's just, you can't, you can't say I'm white and Christian. I mean, I guess you could, but why you're either a Christian or you're not, who cares what color the skin you are. Jesus died for all nations. Right. So you saying who you, you're a Christian shouldn't also come along with the color of your skin and in your sexuality, identify your sexual identification. I don't say I am a Christian and I'm a white straight female. I mean, I don't because I'm a Christian is enough, but he's exchanged one ideology for another. He sees himself as a heroic man, but he is actually just bowing to the culture. Does this make the church weak? Well, what do I mean when I say the church is weak overall? Because I'm generalizing that by saying the church, I'm saying people who call themselves Christians. Again, the updated stat by Barna this year, 2023, is that 64% of Americans claim to be Christian, but only 4% have a biblical worldview. That means 64% of the American population, the majority, are identifying with the ideology of Christianity. But so this man would be one of them. The other two who dress like women would be the other, other part of that 64% who claim it. But they're not thinking that way. They're thinking along that line of Marxism in this case, because, and I don't know that that's his actual worldview, um, but this ideology stems from that. So he's not thinking biblically. So I don't think Webb, from the fruit that I see, um, is, and, and we are supposed to judge the fruit as Christians, don't forget, lives for God. How can he? He doesn't even say that he is a Christian in this statement. His identity is not tied in to his uh, following Jesus Christ as a man of God. He does not hold to biblical sexual ethics. He dressed in a dra as in drag at a Christian award, award show. He is gay affirming. The fruit is rotten. What makes the church weak is that he doesn't get tossed out on his butt by the church. So you might be like, whoa, whoa, that's harsh. We're supposed to be loving. We are supposed to be loving, but loving, saying you're loving and omitting the truth is weakness. And it's not real love. You're loving yourself because you just don't want the repercussions of speaking the truth. And that's what people need to re realize. When the church says, we're just supposed to be loving and share the gospel. Show me where it says that in scripture. Show me where it says that in scripture. Yes, you're going to see, speak the truth in love. And you're going to see what love is and what love is not in 1 Corinthians 13. 
but you won't see where it says, just speak the gospel. Jesus came into the church also to the temple with whips and drove out those who were using his father's house as a place of where he said it's supposed to be a house of prayer as a den of thieves. So we have to remember that Jesus is the gospel and he still drove people out of the temple. Now, that does sound harsh, but it might sound mean, but it's biblical. Let's read 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 12. And I'm going to pause here at certain parts to explain the context, okay? There's going to be a couple um, places of where I embed passages of scripture throughout here, because again, I've said it before and I'll say it again. My opinion doesn't matter. What matters is that we go back to the Bible for how to handle these cultural issues of today. If this if the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, then it applies to every situation throughout the times, all times of history, even today. So how do we address people who walk into the devil words and say, I'm a Christian and I'm here to show you that we should be gay affirming. Let's look at it. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and this is what he says. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. So let's pause. Paul is talking about incest here. He said this was so bad that pagans didn't even allow it, but the church is allowing it. And Paul is addressing incest in the church. Okay, so he says this, a man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? Pause. This is supposed to be the posture of the church when it comes to sin. We mourn it. And the brother or sister in Christ who confidently walks into the church with it, we mourn for them and say, whoa, whoa, why is this, why does this person feel comfortable enough to walk into this church and sit here and us clap along with them? We don't celebrate that. We mourn that because it's sin. Let's unpause. For my part, even though I am not physically present, I'm with you in spirit as one who is present with you in this way. I have already passed judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you're assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Okay, pause. Paul said a lot there. He's telling them how to handle it now. He's saying, I'm not even with you and I'm judging him because I'm with you in spirit. You guys haven't done anything. He said, get him out of there. Hand him over to the to satan for the destruction of the flesh okay so here we go isn't paul being mean someone would say that's so mean we just can't do that hand him over to satan why do you do that go back to what paul says it's the only hope for the for the one wrapped up in living a lifestyle of sin so that his fleshly desires are destroyed and he may be saved to come to himself you get him out of the church hand him over to Satan. Romans one says that we, that God hands us over to a depraved mind, which is mercy, an act of mercy. So hopefully we will come to ourselves like the prodigal son also did, but he's saying, you don't just sit there and let him be in your church. If the church applauds, the culture is going to continue to dwell in sin. If the church applauds, why would he think anything's wrong with it? No one's telling him that it's sin. So the church has to get bold and hold to the standards that God has set, not the church. And the culture can clearly see the lines of sin and say, okay, we're either going to say, I don't want to be a part of that at all. So I won't step foot back into that church or I got to change my lifestyle and repent. So the church will accept me back into the family of God. That's the part of it that Paul's saying. And then Paul says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, pause again. So leaven here represents sin. And Paul is referring to a little leaven ruining the entire lump. What is the leaven? A little bit of sin ruining what? The entire church. It means compromise. If you allow a little bit of compromise, it's going to ruin the entire group, the family of God. So don't compromise just like leaven. It's going to grow and run through the entire thing. So let's pick up at verse nine. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. 
not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunk, drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. Pause. That's heavy. That's heavy. But that is from Paul in the Bible. I don't think it can be any clearer than that. He's saying, you can't leave the world. I'm not telling you to not associate with unbelievers. And we have to do that carefully, right? How we associate with them, showing them the love of God. But he's saying, if they once they call themselves a Christian and they come in with their immorality, no, you get them out and you do not associate with them. So it, can, it can't be clearer than that. Why are these men dressed like women allowed to be called Christian artists at a Christian music award? With without at least the church calling it out, without other people speaking up about it and saying, hey, that is not, that is not acceptable. Not because I wrote the book and I made the commandment, but because I'm holding to what God has said. I'll tell you why no one's calling it out because the church is wimp wimpy and it's weak and it's woke. And that's exactly what, what John's book is about. So let's pick up at verse 12. What business is it of mine? This is what Paul's saying to judge those outside the church. Are you not to judge, judge those who are inside? God will judge those outside, but expel the wicked person from among you. And there it is. Expel the wicked person from among you who calls themselves a Christian and feels comfortable plunking his butt in the middle of the church with a woman's dress on, knowing the church won't say a word. So now let's get back to the Dove Awards. Per ChristianHeadlines.com, they say earlier this year, Webb released a song with Grant, Flamey Grant, titled Boys Will Be Girls. The song's release was part of Webb's latest album, which he described as his first Christian gospel album in 10 years. First Christian and gospel album in 10 years. It, it, it's, it's a complete contradiction. And I left the link. For the sh in the show notes for you if you want to read it. And then John C Cooper, he was on um, OWN, OAN, and he said, America is on the brink of destruction because the Christian church isn't acting like the Christian church. There is a lot of compromise in Christian music, just like there is in Christianity in general. The Doves did not host them or invite them because anyone can get tickets and come. However, the industry is not doing a good job on clarity with what we're willing to say that is okay and what is not okay. Some of the biggest worship leaders in the world have publicly published things that are pro-choice, affirming LGBT lifestyles and calling out other Christians as hateful if they call Leah Thomas, a biological man, a man. What you're dealing with right now is the fact that a lot of Christian musicians are very confused about what the Bible says. And to those worship singers, I want to say, you're the one being hateful by confusing the world. You're the one being hateful by rejecting God's created order. Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We have a lot of work to do in the Christian music industry. So when asked why we aren't seeing more people rising up and speaking out against this, John said, I think there should be people standing up. But I understand sometimes why there's not. It's because we're dealing with a culture and a church that is wimpy, weak, and woke. We recognize that we need to be compassionate and loving to people who don't agree with us. What makes you wimpy and weak is when you don't want to tell someone the truth because you think it's more important to be polite. So again, I'm thankful for John. He's a strong male voice for the church with a large platform. And I'm proud of him for taking the heat to speak up like he does. And you might think people like John with a huge following don't need us to thank them or show our appreciation, but he does. We are all part of the body of Christ. And when we see someone standing for the truth, it is our duty as part of the family of God to support them for putting their necks on the line, for choosing to stand on the front lines of a very hostile and hateful culture and tell them that we're behind them. So if that's all you can do, then do that. Send, send him an email or a message on Instagram or social media or something and just say, I appreciate your stance and thank you because he sells records and he's not compromising the truth to sell more records. He has a podcast and he speaks the truth on his podcast. So um, 
again, I'm, I'm appreciative of him using his platform, but he's outnumbered. I mean, he's outnumbered by those who have large pr platforms and those who call themselves Christians. There's not as many, there's not as many John Coopers as there are and Andy Stanley's at the moment. And so that's one example of how the church is weak today. It's because of compromise, a little bit of leaven, a little bit of leaven and leaven represents sin. We don't want the fight, but here's the thing. We're always in a fight. I mean, Ephesians 6 reminds us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but that, but that this is a spiritual battle. We must remember that and fight this battle on our knees and with the word of God. And one of the, one of the verses that convicts me often is, is in Acts chapter two, when it talks about how the apostles and the church, the early church was devoted to prayer. So you'll see that they were devoted with breaking bread and fellowship and things like that, but they were devoted to prayer. And that word devoted gets me every time. Cause I'm like, I pray, I go throughout my day and I pray, but the word devoted, am I devoted to prayer? Are there times when other things can take precedence over prayer? Yeah, sure. I want to be devoted to pray to prayer because I want to remember that there is a battle that I cannot see beyond this physical realm that I am living in, but that when I get on my knees and pray to a God in heaven who is spirit and who sees that what's beyond this temporal and physical life, then I am entering into that battle with by spiritual means and uh, activating heaven, asking God to in, invade, you know, the things that I cannot see. So I would ask myself as you're listening, am I devoted to prayer? Am I devoted to the spiritual, spiritual disciplines that put me into this spiritual battle where I'm engaging with, you know, by, by praying, by reading scripture, by remembering to stand on the word. It's, it's uh, definitely a way to check your, you know, where you are. And, and again, I do that myself. I posted this week about the Middle East war and anti-Semitism that's growing all over the world. And honestly, I'm, I'm shocked by it, you know, especially on co college campuses, which isn't a shocker. Um, but I, I'm just like, oh my goodness, it, it, it's shocking to see that, that level of hatred. I never thought in a million years that the same attitude that started the Holocaust and the gassing of over 6 million Jews would run rampant in a country who said it would never happen again. Can you imagine what mothers of these young Jewish kids feel right now? I mean, some of them are being locked up in classrooms while people are beating on the door. They want to hurt them. They don't even live in Israel the fear that they must feel. And yet many in the church are quiet. Eh, it's not happening in my house. It's not happening here. I don't want to deal with that. I'm supposed to take care of my own. Are we praying? Are we praying about these things? Are we going to the Lord and saying, God help them? I mean, maybe we are, I'm not accusing people of not doing that, but they're, the Bible says that we mourn with those who mourn. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. What does that mean? We bear the burdens of one another. We bear the burdens of one another. So even though right now I may not have to deal with that, thank the good Lord, praying to God that I never have to, I should be just as mournful over the fact that others are dealing with that. People are afraid to speak out against the atrocities of terrorism. Terrorism. If you just look, it's not about, you know, innocent people in Gaza. and blah. There are innocent people in Gaza and I feel bad for them, but Hamas, the terrorist group, started this. And that's what Israel is defending themselves against. We need to be educated as well. And we need to know what's going on. Israel has every right to defend themselves and get their hostages back. Meanwhile, over in La La Land, there are Christian women literally dancing and singing to the books of the New Testament in rap. I'm not kidding. This is real on Instagram. And I sit there and my husband's like, I don't know how you can watch it. I watch it because I really want to know. It's like, it's like gauging the temperature of the American church. That's why I watch it. What are they, what are these other Christian women talking about? Oh, they're dancing to reels with the New Testament gospels. And they're, they're saying you can teach your kids this way and you can even do it with a stank face. It's in the caption. There are Christian women dancing to reels saying, oh, this is how you should prepare your Baptist friends to attend a Pentecostal church. And they're doing dance moves. And they have thousands of followers and likes and shares. And look, I'm not trying to be a killjoy. I, I warned you guys, this is going to be a heavy episode. 
because that's happening in the United States church. I'm all about having fun. And you can ask my friends, you can ask my family. I love to get jiggy with it every now and then. I love to dance and have fun and laugh at really dumb jokes. But we're talking about a Christian worldview here. The state of a culture that is literally defying biological reality and the church is singing and dancing with stank faces. That's what they're saying. Those are the captions. The state of the American church. Meanwhile, rapping to books of the Bible. And it's, to me, I'm blown away. Like they don't take on heavy topics. They don't talk about the transgender issue. I went and looked, I look at their feeds. It's too hard to do that because people will end up shutting you off and be like, I don't want to hear you anymore. You're so negative. But I mean, I, I, I refuse to do it. I told my friends before, I'm like, I will not dance to a reel and post it on my, my Instagram page or my social media page. I respect my listeners too much, to be honest with you. So is there a time for joy? Of course. Ecclesiastes says, tells us there's a time for mourning, a time for rejoicing, a time for singing and dancing and all of that. But our culture is in trouble. And I say in the opening of my podcast, does every Christian have to give a voice to every issue in the world? No. How can we? We don't know everything about everything, right? I don't know everything about everything. I can't take on every topic. I get guests for that. But is there a moral responsibility to speak the truth? I mean, I want to ponder that thought for a minute. Is there a moral responsibility as a Christian to speak the truth? Isn't the answer yes? If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that means Christianity is true and Christians are responsible to speak the truth if we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. What is the salt? It's the preserver, the seasoning. It's the truth we speak. So if you know something is true or false, especially when it comes to biblical sexual ethics, which is marriage, male and female, then your responsibility is to speak the truth. There are other examples of the church being wimpy. There's a lot of them, at least. Andy Stanley, you probably heard a lot about him from other people talking about it. He's a mega church pastor, son of Charles Stanley. And he just hosted a huge conference on how Christians can love their children through homosexuality and trans identity struggles. And he says, but guys, I'm being theologically neutral. There is no such thing. Theologically neutral is code for I'm a wimp. It, it really is. I'm going to water down the word real quick. You know why? Because we're in the 21st century and the church needs to be loving and accepting of all people. Again, you're going to have to show me where it says that in the Bible because God's word doesn't change. So how does the church in the West show its weakness? And how do we get here? The church shows its weakness when it wants the same things the culture wants. We chase after those things that Jesus said in Matthew 6, 23, that the world strives after you know, all the physical and temporal satisfaction. And God says, but the things that you need, don't worry. I'm, I'm going to make sure that you have those things. The church shows its weakness when we fear the world and the backlash we're going to get when we stand for the truth of God's word. And with the fear of man comes the approval, approval of man. If I'm afraid of man, I'm going to want his approval. So I don't have to suffer the wrath of man. The gospel tells us that many believe Jesus was the Christ, but because they love their positions in the political and religious sphere, they would not confess him as Christ. I mean, get that. That's a shocking verse. Many believe that he was the Christ, the son of God, but they would not confess him as such because I don't want to lose my standing with all the people around me. And we get here through compromise. It's the same thing Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm studying the book of Genesis right now and just finished the destruction of Sodom. I was telling my husband about this the other day, which I'm sure he probably gets as annoyed with me as other people do. He has to listen to me every day. You guys get to push play and listen when the podcast drops. He lives with me. And so I'm always like, listen to this. But before the Lord went back to check on Sodom, he revealed his plan to destroy Sodom, you know, if the outcry against it was true. And so he tells Abraham, and about his plan, and Abraham pleads with the Lord to spare Sodom, even if there were only 10 righteous men in it. And the Lord promises, yeah, I'll spare Sodom if there's at least 10 righteous men. When when the angels of the Lord get to Sodom, Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, was sitting in the town square where all of the hubbub was happening. And Lot was comfortable enough to be in the middle of the town, but he would not allow the angels of the Lord to stay there. He pleaded with them to stay in his house because Lot knew the evil in Sodom. And he knew what would happen if those angels of the Lord 
stayed in the town square. Yet Lot was doing it. And as I studied, there were two words that stood out to me in regard to Lot's attitude. And I can't, I'm not going to read all the text here. So go back to Genesis 9, 19, I believe it is, and read the whole chapter. It's so good. But the two words are sojourn and linger. They literally was like, I got to look these words up. So I looked them up and I wanted to dive in de deeper to that. So sojourn and linger. The men who press against the door of Lot's house, trying to get to the messengers of God and have relations with them, called him a sojourner. Lot, who is this sojourner? He's now trying to become a judge because a sojourner is somebody who only stays for a short period of time. Lot was just supposed to be passing through. But as we read Lot's story and how he calls these men brothers, we see he's trying to befriend these men who are clearly morally corrupt. And they recognize, hey, you were just supposed to be passing through. And now you've just stayed around here and you want to judge us. So he was supposed to pass through. He didn't. He stayed. And we see that with the word linger. He offers these men. He says, Lot comes out and says, oh, men, don't do this wickedness. I got two virgin girls. I'll throw them out here and you can have your way with them. What the heck? Gross. And he's. You know, they want to sleep with the with the messengers of the Lord, the men, the corrupt city, men of Sodom. But law offers them a better, moral, more morally acceptable plan, according to him, that he could sleep with the they could sleep with his virgin daughters. According to Lot's now skewed view of morality. Why? Because he's compromising. He was supposed to go through Sodom. I don't even know if he was supposed to go through Sodom, but his plan was to just keep going through Sodom, but he stayed in Sodom and he began to compromise. So Lot's compromise with Sodom becomes more and more clear as the messengers of God try and get him and his family out. They're pleading with him, get out, Lot. We're going to destroy the city. Get out. Get your family. Get your get your wife. Get your, your daughters. Get out of the city. The Bible then tells us that Lot lingered. That's what Lot was used to doing, lingering in all the wrong places. And to linger means to stay in a place longer than you should because of a reluctance to leave. He didn't really want, he was like trying to convince his future sons-in-law to go with him. They wouldn't listen. They thought he was kidding. And then as they're they're going out, which Lot didn't say, okay, right, let's go now. They drug him out, grabbed him and his daughters by the arms and his wife and drug them out of Sodom. The angels alert. Talk about the mercy of God. And then Lot's wife looks back while the city is being destroyed and she turns into a pillar of salt. So she either looked back and longed for the city or she just plain old disobeyed God by not fleeing. And she turns to look back and they told her not to, which it could be a mixture of both, right? But she turns into a pillar of salt because she looked back at Sodom. And finally, once Lot and his daughters are out, they find it within themselves to get their dad drunk and sleep, sleep with him so they can bear children by him. So his daughters are corrupt. How did Lot get here to thinking that it's really bad if men want to sleep with the angels of, of the Lord? But it's not as bad if they just have their way with my two virgin daughters. And then for his daughters to think that it's okay to get their dad drunk and commit incest with him. Which is exactly what Paul was saying First Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, that even the pagans, the, those outside the church, wouldn't even do that. They know that that's wrong. But not to Lot, who compromised his way into thinking that that would be a better plan. That's what happens when we compromise. So what is the posture of the Christian supposed to be today? First, we don't fear. We don't fear man and we don't fear the things that the world fears. First Peter 3, 14 and 15 says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ. The Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. In Peter's letter, we see we are to do several things. One, we don't fear those who cause suffering to the church. If we fear man, we don't fear God because you literally, you're going to exchange one for the other. Now, is that easy to, to say? Yeah. Is it hard to do? Yeah. I admit, I told you guys a couple episodes ago that I also can get anxious and I turn back to Psalms 91, but I remind myself if I allow the fear to have power over me, fear of man, I'm going to try to appease them because it's either fearing man or fearing God. And God's the one who promises to protect us. Second, we're not to be troubled. 
And that means to be distressed or anxious. And that takes some reminding of who God is so we can be confident in who he is and be courageous and bold to not be troubled. And finally, Peter's saying, be ready to defend the faith. You better have a good answer. I don't know. To be ready is always to be ready to go into battle. Always be ready for that opportunity. And that's what we're, it doesn't mean you have to go out and be like, okay, where, who am I going to take on today? I'm not saying that. I'm saying when the opportunity arises to speak the truth, be ready for that. In many places in the Bible, it tells us not to be afraid, to be strong and courageous because God's with us. The Bible tells us not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good, to not fret over evil because it only causes harm. Psalm 37 is a great Psalm. If you want to read that, I highly recommend it. It will comfort you and encourage you as well. Our focus is on the Lord because our trust is in him, right? Next, the church is to be holy. And this is what I, I think the 21st century church today is forgetting. That holy is set apart. We are never, as the church, as we live for God, if we truly live for him, we are always going to be different. First Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Holy is what the church is supposed to be. Jesus says in Revelation, he's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. What does that mean? It means without compromise, spot and wrinkle. I mean, just think about when you get a spot on your shirt, you know it, but some other people might not realize it. It means we are to be holy and set apart. We don't look like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't sound like the world. So when we're saying, here's my stank face and trying to be funny, it's like, well, you look a lot like the world. You just put some, you threw some New Testament books of the Bible in there and you put the same rap beat as everybody else. Some translations say that we're a peculiar people. Peculiar means strange or odd, not weird, strange or odd in the sense of, hey, you don't live like the rest of us. It means you stand out because you're not the same. That has to be okay with us. It has to be okay that we don't participate in the same kind of language that the world does. It has to be okay with us that we don't get drunk like the world does. It has to be okay that we don't do relationships and sleep around like the world does. When we want to be similar to the world, we begin to compromise. So I want to leave you with some more examples of the Bible from those who have gone on before us. And let me remind you that Hebrews 12, 1 talks about the great faith giants who have gone on before us. I want to just go over a little bit of what they encountered during the times that they lived in and let this be the fi final part of this episode that I hope encourages you. Hebrews 12, 1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Chapter 11 of Hebrews tells us who some of those faith giants are, Abraham, Sarah, Enoch, Noah, but it's also Moses who stood up and stood for a people enslaved by Egypt for more than 400 years. Pharaoh was the, they were the people who basically ruled the earth at the time the known earth right right the known world and moses went in and he stood up to him esther who came into her position as queen of persia to boldly walk into the king's chamber and plead for the lives of those who were under the persecution of haman daniel who purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with delicacies of babylon the ruler of the known world at his time Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would not bow the knee and compromise to a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, and they didn't excuse it away by saying, it's only material, it's not real, God will excuse it. They didn't say that. They would not compromise in this instance. All of the prophets who lost their lives or went to prison for speaking unpopular truths to a nation that turned their backs on God are also the faith giants. These men and women looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, and we look back at his coming, his death and resurrection. And the thing that they put their trust and hope in was his coming. The thing we put our trust and hope in is that he came. And we move forward with the same confidence and stand up and stand out in a culture that rejects the truth of God and his return. Look, the culture's always been the same. We've just lived in America our entire lives and it has been different here, but every culture has been hostile towards the truth of God. It's just the way that it is. None of these faith giants were weak. 
They did not compromise. They did not care if the culture accepted them or not. And God question says this, we are surrounded by the saints of the past in a unique way. It's not that the fruit, the faithful who have gone before us are spectators to the race that we run. Rather, it is a figurative representation and means that we ought to act as if they were in sight and cheering us on to the same victory in the life of faith that they obtained. We are to be inspired by the godly example these saints set during their lives. These are those whose past lives of faith encourage others to live that way too. That the cloud is referred to as great indicates that millions of believers have gone before us each bearing witness to the life of faith we now live. I want to close this out today by reminding you that your courage and strength spurs on others running their race for Christ. Your boldness is the, in the face of evil straightens the backs of those who get anxious over these events. I think of people who are not believers putting their necks on the line for basic truth like J.K. Rowling, or Rowling, however you say her name. She's a fierce advocate for women having their own spaces separate from men. She's a feminist. She's not a Christian, but she lives out what she believes as a femi feminist. I have to respect her for that, although I don't agree with her ideology, but she takes the heat. She stands for basic biological realities. Why don't Christians do that? Christians with larger platforms. Christianity Today doesn't do that. Andy Stanley doesn't do that. Instead, I'm often surprised at the compromises made by Christian leaders and at the silence of others. And look, I get it. This topic is hard. It's a hard reality to look around and assess the church and say that the overall American church is at its weakest point ever. But we can do something about it. We can be bold and courageous right where God has put us because he placed us here for a reason. I have a podcast and a YouTube channel and I speak out about these things a lot. I get it. But one thing I often remind myself is that God also wants me to live my life daily with joy and to pour into those in my life, like my family and my friends and my church. We can't be consumed by these things, right? Or as the psalmist put it, overcome by evil. We have to find that balance. So I do get that not everybody has an Instagram account or a social media account or a podcast. So they're not talking about these things all the time. I, I get it. But we're never to compromise our convictions or the truth of God's word. So how do we, how do we balance it? I think we do it by viewing things from an opportunity type of situation, like opportunistic, right? If I hear a lie, it's the opportunity to speak the truth. If I see evil, it's an opportunity to do good. So don't let the opportunity pass you by because of fear of man or approval of man. See it as an opportunity in a moment of time where you get to stand for the truth as you run this race with so great a cloud of witnesses as those who have gone on before you. I know this episode was a bit on the heavy side. We have lots of opportunities for lighter episodes as we get into November and December. And I really do look forward to sharing those with you. But I also want to have real conversations because we are the family of God and we are in this together. If you have any questions for me, email me at hello at shanduffelbright.com and I'll catch you on the next one.